But Yu Mei Wang, director of geohazards for Oregon, believes we must still take action. We know that a Cascadia earthquake is inevitable. We can't prevent earthquakes, but one thing that we can do is prevent a lot of the damage. We can save lives if we prepare now. That preparation must be based on our current understanding of what the next Cascadia earthquake will be like. What follows is a reconstruction based on the knowledge of leading experts of what may happen, what it would look and feel like to experience a megathrust earthquake. We don't know what actually sets the earthquake off, but typically um, it would probably start at some rough spot on the fault. The rupture is most likely to start at one end of the fault. It would then spread along the fault at over 7,000 miles per hour. As it tears, the North American plate, which has been pushed inwards, would spring back releasing the strain. There may be a region four or five hundred kilometers long where the, the seafloor has suddenly risen up by two or three meters. It happens so fast that it lifts up the whole body of the water on top of it. And as a result, suddenly the, the sea surface finds itself two or three meters higher than it was before over a large area, and that sets off a wave. This is the tsunami, which would radiate out in all directions. Part of it would head out into the Pacific, and part would head directly for the coast of North America. The situation in the Pacific Northwest would be very different. The tsunami would arrive there in half an hour, and they'd have the earthquake to deal with first. The seismic waves which carry the shaking would be traveling through the earth at over 10,000 miles per hour, much faster than the tsunami. In just a few seconds, the earthquake would reach the land. The earthquake would be at its most violent here on the coast. They're right at ground zero of the shaking. So the shaking they feel will be the largest of anybody because they're nearest to the fault rupture. But the shaking wouldn't have reached the inland cities yet. People here wouldn't even know that an earthquake had started. However, news would have reached the emergency services. This is the Washington State Emergency Operations Center. It would be one of the first places to receive an alert from the Tsunami Warning Center. Plenary magnitude 9. We're activating our ELC to a phase 3 for a tsunami. Horizon filmed them rehearsing for a major earthquake. The two on-duty officers would immediately activate the center and start calling in staff. And what could be your possible ETA to the ELC? Okay. Their job would be to coordinate the emergency response. But there would be no time to issue a public warning before the earthquake hits the big cities. Up to two minutes after the start of the earthquake, the seismic waves would reach the city of Seattle. Because of the distance, the different types of seismic wave would have separated out, with the faster compression waves reaching the city first. The first thing you sense uh, is a vertical acceleration. You, you get pushed up a little bit, and you think it's maybe uh, a jolt of a train going by or something of that type. But then uh, later, maybe uh, 20 seconds even later, you might feel start to feel the, the shear waves coming in, which are shearing motions in the earth, the kind of motion that does most of the damage. 
These sheer waves would move the Earth from side to side by as much as a meter. There would also be surface waves, like ocean waves rippling through the solid Earth. If you uh, are at, in a parking lot, it's likely that you see waves rolling across the parking lot, like if you took a carpet and shook it. As the shaking becomes more and more intense, people would realize that this was no ordinary earthquake. That shaking will continue to build. You'll feel the first sway, and it'll start to build and build and build, and you'll wonder when it's going to stop. Indoors, objects and furniture would be hurled around the room. Parts of the building may start to fall. Right when you feel the earthquake shaking, what we train people to do is to duck cover and hold. Schools and offices now practice this life-saving maneuver, going under a strong desk and holding onto it. Anything that might fall won't fall on you directly. It will fall on the table, and the whole time you protect your... For people outside, the major hazard would be falling debris and shattering glass. If you're outside somewhere, the best thing to do is to move quickly into open space, such as away from a building where you might have falling objects. Buildings would now be exposed to huge forces as they're shunted back and forth. The unreinforced masonry buildings would be the first to suffer damage. The weakest points start to fail. In most cases, because they're older structures, it's the mortar. The elements that support the building vertically, if they start to come down, the floors themselves potentially can come down. Collapsing URMs could cause many fatalities throughout the region. The shaking in Seattle would now have been going on for two minutes, but we'd only be halfway through. For a typical earthquake, if a building gets damaged in the first 20, 30 seconds, it very likely can remain standing. But if that damaged building is shaken for another three minutes, then that damage can propagate into collapse. Meanwhile, the large movements of the ground would be making skyscrapers bend further and further. You may see the buildings begin to sway more and more violently to the point where they start to perhaps lose the windows. Uh, they may in addition, start to uh, have some fracturing of welds and steel frame buildings. What happens after that is, uh, is anybody's guess. The worst case scenario would be the total collapse of a high-rise building. Meanwhile, buildings on higher ground would be suffering their own problems. Earthquakes this large can generate uh, landslides at distances up to hundreds of miles away. The classic worst case scenario where you're on a hill, the landslide, your, your house goes with it, and the house will obviously be destroyed. Five minutes after the start of the earthquake, the rupture would have reached the northern end of the fault. Vancouver would still be experiencing powerful shaking. But in Seattle, the earthquake would finally be subsiding. For people in buildings that have suffered structural damage, now it would be time to evacuate. What would have felt like the longest few minutes of people's lives will finally be over. But on the coast, the ordeal would have only just begun. The tsunami, unleashed by the earthquake, would be minutes away. For the Pacific Northwest, the tsunami warning system that should save lives across the world 
would be virtually useless. There won't be time for the Tsunami Warning Center to detect that earthquake, make a determination whether or not it was tsunamogenic, then send a warning down to emergency managers in Washington who will then send it to the people. Um, that would waste valuable time. People need to know that when they feel strong shaking, if they're on the coast, they need to go to high ground and or inland. The tsunami will have started out as a wave of only a meter or two high, traveling at huge speed. But as it nears the coast, it starts to rise up. Those waves can grow, they can amplify as more and more water piles up in shallow water, and all of that energy then causes the wave to slow down and grow in amplitude uh, and create waves that have been known to be uh, hundreds of feet high. That first wave is often simply a step in the water level, and the water level then stays up high for five or ten minutes before it eventually drains away again. Just as happened in Indonesia, within half an hour of the earthquake, the tsunami would rush onto the land, more like an ever-growing tide than a normal wave. Anyone who doesn't manage to get inland or to high ground in time would be unlikely to survive. The tsunami will devastate hundreds of miles of coast. In total, more than 50,000 square miles will be affected by the earthquake. Unfortunately, I don't think people understand that a Cascadia earthquake is going to be so very different than the other types of earthquakes that we've all experienced, or many of us have experienced. Um, one of the main differences is that it's going to affect such a large region. It's not just going to be city of Seattle or city of Portland. It could be an 800-mile stretch of Washington, Oregon, and California that gets affected. Until recently, many people would have found it difficult to imagine that scale of devastation. But the Boxing Day disaster changed all that. The Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami will remind those people that are living in the Pacific Northwest that this is something they will have to face in the future. And the window of opportunity that now exists should be used to make sure that the people that live in that part of the world are educated in terms of how to respond when the earthquake happens. The simple knowledge that after an earthquake, people should move away from the ocean and to high ground can save lives. The scientists who discovered this threat are now playing their part in spreading the word to as many people as possible. Goes all the way up to a salt marsh. So I start here. Before the next earthquake. We know that this Cascadia earthquake is imminent. It's imminent in geologic time. So basically, we're in a race against time. And the more we can get done now, the more lives we'll save. If we have 10 years, is that enough? Uh, probably not. If we have 50 years, uh, maybe. You know, If we have a century, um, you know, maybe we'll really be ready. But do we have a century? Uh, we don't know. The Indonesian earthquake has given the people of the Pacific Northwest a glimpse of what they will one day face. Now they must heed that warning. <laughs>